This week, I was looking for a fancy, self-hosted option to monitor all of my services in my home lab. I was looking for something that was open source, self-hosted, and well, fancy at the same time. At least a little more fancy than the old tool Nagios I used to run a while back. Now don't get me wrong, Nagios is a great tool and great at what it does. But I need something a little bit lighter and I'm tired of hearing that buzz every time something goes down. I'd rather switch to something that's a little more and less. That's when I discovered Uptime Kuma. Uptime Kuma is an open source, self-hosted option like the popular service Uptime Robot. It helps you monitor all of your services running in your home lab or anywhere. It can monitor HTTP services looking for specific HTTP codes, or it could even scrape websites looking for specific keywords. It can monitor TCP services, so if you want to check to make sure that your SSH connection is up, you can. It can even do a traditional ping to make sure a system is up. And it can even do DNS record checking. It's built on top of fancy frameworks like Vue and Bootstrap, which will give us a fast and responsive and good looking UI. It also supports fancy notifications that can be delivered via Telegram, Slack, Discord, email, and 70 other services you can configure to deliver notifications just the way you like. It also has a fancy status page, just like some of the status pages you see on public facing sites to report their service uptime. And you even get a fancy dashboard with history, states, and a list of all of your services that you're monitoring. It supports fancy two-factor authentication too to help keep your dashboard safe. And did I mention, it's pretty fancy. It really is, you gotta see it. So if you're tired of and, and want some more of, join me as we set up and configure Uptime Kuma. It really is fancy. So today we'll get Uptime Kuma up and running. Then we'll configure a monitor of each type. We'll configure an HTTP, an HTTP with keywords, a TCP, a ping, and even DNS. Then we'll set up some alerts to make sure that we know when services go down. And then we'll set up two-factor auth to keep our dashboard safe. And if any of this sounds good to you, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I should mention that because it's a container, you're gonna need some kind of containerization engine to run this on. We'll cover plain old Docker and Docker Compose, but feel free to set this up using Docker, Rancher, Kubernetes, Open Media Vault, or any other containerization platform that has Docker or Containerd. Because it should work there, as it will on my machine, as it will on a server, a desktop, or a Raspberry Pi. Also, all the documentation and configuration that we covered today will be on my documentation site, and you can find that in the description below. And so for us today, we're gonna use Docker and Docker Compose. We're gonna use Docker Compose because it's pretty easy, it's pretty common, and it allows me to share my configuration with you so you can copy and paste it. Open up a terminal and run docker-v and you should see an output. Then you should be able to run docker-compose-v and see an output there too. If you do, great. If you don't, see my documentation and it'll show you how to set it up. Next, you'll want to run mkdir uptime kuma to make a directory to keep some of the files that we're going to mount from Docker. Then we'll want to cd into that directory. Then you'll want to create a file called docker-compose.yaml. And then we'll want to edit that file with an editor. In our docker compose file, we'll want to paste some configuration in there. In this configuration file, we'll want to paste the contents here. And this is a simple, typical Docker Compose file. So first, we have a version. So this is the Docker Compose API version. I'm using version 3.1. Next, we're going to define a service. I'm naming that service uptime-kuma. And then I'm going to use the image Luis Lam or Luis Lam or Luis Lam uptime-kuma. And then with a tag of one. Now, you can use the latest tag or you can use any tag that's on Docker Hub but it seems like this one tag is what they want you to use. And looking through the logs, it looks like they just always update the one tag with the latest version of one. Next, we're gonna specify a container name and I'm just gonna name this uptime-kuma. Next, we're gonna specify our volumes. So these are volumes that will be mounted from the container to the file system on the host machine. So on the left side is the path on our host system. And on the right side is the path inside of the container. On the left side, I'm going to mount mine to my home directory, to the user server admin, to underscore docker files, to uptime kuma, and then a folder called data. We need to make that folder data still, but we'll get to that in a second. And next, we're going to expose some ports. 
And so 3001 is the port that they expose internally. So on the right side, it's the inside of the container is 3001. And on the right side is the outside. And I'm also gonna expose 3001. Now, you can change this left side to be whatever you'd like, but you can't change the right side. And our restart policy, I typically say unless stop. So it's gonna keep restarting itself if it crashes until we stop it ourselves. And then security options, one I typically use is no new privileges equals true. And this is for permissions and it'll just make sure that nothing within the container can elevate itself. And this is a pretty straightforward configuration. So let's copy this and let's paste this inside of that docker-compose YAML file on our server or wherever it is. And let's save this, let's close out. Now remember in our config, we were mapping to a data folder within this folder. So we need to make a data folder. So make a data directory. Then let's do an LS to see what's in here. So we should have a data directory and then our docker-compose YAML file. And this is all we need to spin it up. So I run docker-compose up-d force-recreate. And I know I don't need to run the force recreate on the first time launching it, but I do it every time because it always works. So we can run that. Now it's pulling down this image and it's created. So if we run a docker ps, we should see this here in the list. And here it is, it's starting and it was created 12 seconds ago and it's been up for five. Then we can do a docker logs uptime kuma to make sure it's running and we can see it's up and going. And then we should be able to see our website if we go to that IP address on port 3001. And here it is. So let's create our account, create, and here it goes. It does look pretty fancy. Before we add some monitors, let's go into settings really quick. I didn't have to put it in light mode, which is a good thing. But if you wanted it to be in light mode, you would click light mode and then immediately go back to dark mode. And if you set auto, it'll auto switch depending on your device's light or dark setting. So in here, you can change the language, you can change the time zone. And if you're hosting this publicly, you can choose whether or not search engines should be able to index this site. And then you can choose your default entry page, which is either dashboard or status. And we'll see both of those here in a second. Here you can change your password and here you can set up two-factor auth. So let's do that real quick while we're here. So if we click on two-factor auth, we can enable two-factor auth. We can scan a barcode. Then we can enter our code, verify our token. It's valid, save, confirm we want it on, and it's enabled, that easy. And then next we can export our backups for this machine. Now, remember, we're writing this data already to the Docker volume that we created, that data folder. So you don't need to back this up, but you could back this up through the UI. Now it says here, it's gonna have some sensitive information in that backup, so to keep it safe and that history won't be included. I couldn't see myself using this at all because I'm actually gonna back up that data directory on disk so that it backs up everything, including history. But cool that it's here. And then if you did use the web to export data, you can use the web to import that data here as well. And then we have options to disable auth, log out, and clear all statistics, so pretty cool. Okay, so let's set up our first monitor. So our first monitor, we're gonna set up the type is HTTP. And don't be confused with HTTPS. We'll set that up here in a little bit, but we're gonna set it up with HTTP. And so the way you would typically use this is you would hit a health check endpoint. Now you could put in a website like google.com and make sure google.com is up, but that puts some additional load on google.com. Not like they really care, but if it was your website, every 60 seconds or so, you would be loading that whole entire web page just for a health check. So most of the time, you wanna have a dedicated health check endpoint. And those health check endpoints are really simple. They're usually like slash health, and they'll respond with a 200 okay, something very, very simple. So for example, this is exactly what I'm talking about, a health check endpoint. So I have a health check endpoint set up on that Raspberry Pi back there. So, sounds odd, but I have it up there so that my other services can check to make sure that it's up. It's not up, then I cycle the power on that thing. I know, I've gone pretty far, but I really do have a health check endpoint on there. And this is a health check endpoint. This is what I was saying, like you don't wanna hit the web page and load the whole entire web page. It's a lot cleaner to hit a health check endpoint. But if you don't have a health check endpoint, we'll set up something a little bit better than this, so don't use this one. But I'll copy this health check endpoint from my Raspberry Pi. I'll paste it into here. And the friendly name is Raspberry Pi LED. Okay, the heartbeat interval is how often it's gonna check. That's totally fine, 60 seconds. Retries, I'll set it to zero. And then how often the retries will happen. 
Since I have it to zero, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna keep it there. And then you have options to ignore certificate errors. This is great if you have self-signed certificates at home. And then you have the option to upside down mode. <laughs> It's kind of confusing, but basically you're saying that, hey, if this service does respond, then consider it down. Now, there are a few edge cases where this makes sense, but in most cases, you're gonna say, hey, if the service is up, consider the service to be up. Next is max redirect. So this is how many times you can get redirected. Uh, 10 should be good. <laughs> 10's a lot of redirects. Uh, but this would be if you set up a redirect on a public web page to redirect to somewhere else, let's say, you had www.example.com, which redirects to example.com. That would be one redirect. And then you had more, so on and so forth. You could set the limit here, but 10 should be good. And now our status codes, so our accepted status codes. So really anything in the HTTP 200 range for a status code is good. It's considered good. And this is typically what you want to choose. But if you wanted to select other status codes in different ranges, in the 300s, you're typically going to get redirects 400 means you made a mistake, and 500 generally means the server made some kind of mistake. That's how I've always remembered it. 200 is you're good, 300 is go away, 400 is I messed up, 500 is you messed up, which would be the server. Okay, so we'll leave that in the 200 range. Next is tags, and, and this is just basically tags. And we can add tags just to kind of group and color code some things. So I'll call this one home and I'm gonna color it indigo and add it, and then we'll save it. So right away, it's been added. And right away, it's actually down. And I know why it's down, I didn't check this beforehand. But this server is on a VLAN that can't contact that Raspberry Pi. It means my firewall rules are working. But those are the things you'll have to think about when you set this up. So what we'll do is go to this cool site, httpstat.us. I use this a lot for development to test different status codes that are kind of hard to generate sometimes on a server but I'm gonna grab a 200 okay. So if we do HTTP stat.us slash 200, we should get a 200 okay. And let's just edit this real quick. Plug it in there and then we'll save and we're back up. Cool, so that's working. And now we can see a percentage in some historical data. If we click on it, we can see all of the checks. So we had two that fail and one that's up. We can see our response time, the average response time, the uptime, the uptime and Oh, certificate expiration. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Didn't notice that. That's actually really awesome. Uh, and then we can see some data or some charts, so some response time data. And then the last couple of status or the last couple of queries down here. So pretty cool. Let's add another one. Let's add another monitor type. Let's add a TCP port monitor type. And next we'll give this a friendly name. So this is one of my K3S servers. So I'll just name it K3S server. The host name, you can use an IP address or a domain name but I'll just use an IP address. Port is 22. We're gonna see if SSH is open. And then again, we have a heartbeat interval, retries and retry interval. So I'm gonna add a new tag and I'll name the tag Kates or Kubernetes. We'll just make it red and then we'll add it and then we'll save. So now I have a new monitor with TCP and here it is. We can go into the details. So it's hitting that IP address on port 22, which is SSH and it's making sure that it can connect on that TCP port. Okay, so that looks good. Next monitor is a ping. And here we're gonna actually ping one of my K3S agents. It's on a different IP, we'll add another tag. We'll select the same one, see it's part of Kubernetes. Okay, and so after we save, we can see them here in the list. Now let's add another monitor. So next is HTTP or HTTPS keyword. So this is what I was talking about earlier. If you don't have a health check endpoint that's gonna return a 200, you can actually do something a little fancier here. And you can actually hit your website and look for content on that website. So that tells you two things. One, that your website is up, and two, that it's actually rendering the HTML. I'll show you what I mean. So let's check out my technotim.live website on technotim.live, and then we're gonna look for a keyword. So on technotim.live, we can actually look for a keyword on here to make sure that this page is actually rendering. So let's actually look for nerd for life. So let's copy that, put it back here, nerd for life. We'll leave everything to the default and maybe we'll add a different tag. We'll say that this is external and go blue and add and then save. 
And here we go. So we're getting from technotim.live, we're getting a 200 OK and the keyword is found. So that's pretty cool. That tells us again, two things. It's up and it's rendering HTML, so it's returning a page. Let's actually change that real quick, just to make sure you understand what's going on here. So what if I said random word, rooster, and we save it. If we save it now, you can see that it's considered down. And let's scroll up here. So if you look, it's considered down. So we got a 200 OK, but the keyword is not found. That's why I said that this is really cool that you can do this instead of just looking for HTTP status codes because you can actually parse that page too. So let's change that back just to make Uptime Kuma happy. Just look for nerd and we'll save that. Now it's considered back up on the next check. Okay, so while we're waiting for that to check, let's add a new monitor and our last monitor type is DNS. This might seem pretty obvious, but we're gonna check DNS records. So I can call this DNS1 and then what's the host name we're actually gonna check for? So let's check for one of my other servers. So juno.local.technotim.live. So that's an internal DNS record. And so the resolver right now is pointing at Cloudflare, but I wanna point it internally to my internal DNS server. So I'm pointing it to my internal DNS server, and then I can choose the record type. So for me, it's just gonna be an A record. Then I'll add another tag for fun, home, and then save. Then once we add it, we can see our DNS record is considered up. So a nice easy way to make sure your DNS server is up and resolving records. Now you can do this again too for a public one. Like if we change this back to Cloudflare and saved it, this should actually fail because this isn't a public record. But if we search for something like google.com on Cloudflare, and saved it, then it will return with a status of up. So now that we have these all set up, we can actually go to our status page. And here's our status page. It's not in dark mode yet, but let's edit this really quick. Switch to dark thing, there we go. Okay, so now let's save that. And then let's edit our status page. So let's add a group of services. So let's add all of our monitors here and then save it. And pretty cool, right here, we have a nice little dashboard, almost like a public facing site where we can see all of our services that we're monitoring and their status. And this is really nice, partially degraded service. So they've automatically determined that because, well, because my site's down, because we changed that, uh, but because one of these services are down in this group, it's considering this partially degraded, so super nice touch. And you can even add incidents here too, which is pretty awesome. So if you wanna create an incident, say, oops, I did it again, terrible singer. But you can add a title and then add content or a message to this. So I'm going to say we're working hard to restore our services until then just wait longer. Okay. So then we can choose an actual style too. So we can choose info. We can choose warning, choose danger, primary light and dark. So let's, let's go, let's go danger. Let's go danger. And we'll post this and here we go. So we have a nice status page that shows how our services are doing. This is why I said it's, it's pretty fancy and it looks great too, but we're not done yet. We're not done yet. So now that we have a services up and going, we have a status page that's up, we still haven't notified ourselves. So we would like to know if one of these services are down. And like I mentioned earlier, you can configure up to 70 notification services. It's super easy to do, but we're gonna configure one that I use a lot, it's Discord. So we can do this in a few ways. You can either do it on add a new monitor, set up a notification, or go into settings and set up notification. We'll do that because it makes a little more sense. But from here, I'm gonna choose Discord. And then we're gonna give this a friendly name. I'm just gonna name it Discord Alert. Next, we're gonna add our Discord webhook URL. So if you don't have a Discord server, it's totally free and it's really easy to get. And if you have Slack or some other notification or chat messaging system, the configuration is very similar, but in Discord, after I have my server set up, we're gonna create a webhook. So it's pretty simple. In Discord, we're gonna go into our server settings, and then in here, we're gonna choose integrations, and then we're gonna choose create a webhook. So in here, we're creating a webhook. And so really quick, webhook sounds super fancy, but really all it is is a web endpoint that you can post data to. All it is is a combination of a URL and a payload. And so that's what we're creating right here in Discord is a URL and then Uptime Kuma will send the payload to it. So let's name this webhook. I'm gonna name mine 
just Kuma, and then you choose the channel you want it to post to. I'm just gonna post directly to General. Then we can give it an icon, so I'm just gonna give it an avatar. And then we're gonna copy the webhook URL to our clipboard and save changes. Now the reason why it's not showing you this webhook is because a webhook is actually a secret too. If anyone gets this webhook, they could post whatever they wanted to this endpoint. So treat this whole entire URL like a secret too, don't share it. So now that we have that set up, let's escape out of here. Let's go back to Uptime Kuma and we'll paste this here. Now I'll show you my webhook because I'm gonna delete this before this video comes out, but this is what I was saying is that this is actually a secret, so don't share this with anyone. It's basically security through obscurity because <laughs> no one could guess this URL. So next, we're actually gonna name our bot. So I'm just gonna name him Kuma and then a prefix if you wanted. So this is a custom message prefix. In here, they have the example, hello at everyone is dot, dot, dot. So if you wanted to mention someone specifically or a group specifically, you could in here, but I'm just gonna put hello. There's no need to mention anyone. I'm the only one in that server. But you could say, mention network admins and mention the network admins for this specific alert or whatever you wanted. You could mention yourself if you're the only one in there. But I'm just gonna put hello for now. So this is really cool. You can actually enable this now for all new monitors that you set up. But let's do that. Say all new monitors. And then another cool piece is you can apply it to all existing monitors. You really thought of everything. So rather than go back through each monitor and turn this on, you can just say apply to all monitors. Before we do that, before we save it, let's actually test it. So let's bring Discord back up and then let's test it. So test, sent, and here it is. Kumabot, Discord, alert testing. Awesome, so that worked. So now let's save this. So let's save it and our alert is set up. So let's actually make this fail. So let's change our DNS. Say the host name, some odd host name like that. Let's save it. And here we go, as soon as I save it, it tells us, hello, your service DNS1 went down. Service DNS1, service URL is HTTPS. Service URL is HTTPS, now that's kind of weird. Service URL, I assume this would be a URL if I had this set up on a domain. The time it went down or time it triggered, and then the error. So query a record not found for this weird domain and today at 9.54. Pretty awesome. So let's change a few more of these. Let's go to our K3S server. Instead, we're gonna ping some IP that doesn't exist and save it. And here we go again. So our service K3S server went down. Service name is K3S server. Service URL is the service we're monitoring on TCP port 22. So this tells me that SSH is down and then the time and then the error. So here's the error. It could not connect or reach this host. I don't know, but let's see if this recovers, if it actually sends a recovery alert. So let's change this back to 19 and let's save it. And it's up and it recovered. Man, they did think of everything. This is awesome. Exactly what I thought would happen, but wasn't sure if it was there. <laughs> So this is pretty awesome. We get the green check mark. Our service, K3S server, is up. So K3S server, service URL on that port, the time, and actually the ping too. So that's really sweet. Exactly what I was hoping would happen. And so now that we've had all these fluctuations and services going up and down, we've actually started collecting some logs and some data. So we can see the stats of our services and each of the messages that triggered something. So, so here's that K3S server coming up. Here it is when it went down. Here was the message it had when it went down. Here's our DNS query that it couldn't find. And then the DNS query it could find and so on and so forth. And then we get quick stats right here. So three up, two down, unknown, and zero are paused. And then if we go to our status page, we can see our status message is still up and we can see a high level overview of our services. They're not looking too happy. So Uptime Kuma is really awesome. Not only is it very functional and we get lots of ways to configure monitors as well as notifications. It also looks pretty darn good. Like this looks great. So what do you think of Uptime Kuma? Are you gonna use Uptime Kuma to monitor your services in your home lab or some of your public services? Are you not gonna monitor anything at all? <laughs> or are you using something else? Let me know in the comments section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Uh, but you, you spin up a media server, you maybe do it on a Pi or low power device, and then you're like, well, I might want to do some transcoding. And then so you upgrade and you're like, okay, I'll do it on a server. Maybe I need a video card in there and 
why not just virtualize it? Because then I can share all this infrastructure. And then you're like, okay, well, I need more storage than this USB attached drive. Maybe I'll get another drive. And then, well, I don't want my media to go away if one drive dies. So I'm going to create an array. And you just go down this spiral path of, you know, then you end up like me with a dish shelf, two, three servers and a cluster and who knows what's going on or what will happen next. So 